Hare Krishna. So today, I'll speak broadly on a couple, on three points, and then we can have some questions. So overall, the topic which I mentioned, which I'll be discussing, is appreciating. Okay. Understanding what faithfulness to tradition means, and not just faithfulness, but a holistic understanding of what faithfulness means. And then based on that, we'll talk about how even within a tradition, there is some flexibility. And then we'll move forward. So I'll start with, I'll be talking three themes, a little more on journey home, and our writing according time, place, circumstance, then Western outreach, and how, what, there's a focus on yoga, and I'll try to explain why there's focus on yoga. And then I'll talk about Govardhan Eco Village, and then I'll talk about expanding the definitions of devotional success. So first, I'll begin with a quote of Srila Prabhupada. Like last time I mentioned that there are, there are we often hear of Prabhupada being, speaking strongly and using strong words. And we think that being faithful to Prabhupada means that. But there is an entirely different aspect of Srila Prabhupada, which has been to this large extent overlooked in our moment. So this is a letter that Prabhupada wrote to Balwant Prabhu in 1972. And he says, now I want that we shall recruit more and more our men among the intelligent class of men. Now, this was 1970s where men, men was a gender inclusive term. It's men and women. But, uh, because they are a little educated or they have got some wealth or some fame or ability. So they will be sometimes little puffed up. But that is all right. They deserve it. Now, we shall have to learn the art, how to approach such higher class of men and attract them to apply themselves to this Krishna consciousness process of self-realization. That requires much tact and we shall have to expect to meet all challenges by sharp minds. But if you remain always absorbed in remembering Lord Chaitanya, how he converted so many intelligent men, even sitting for three days and nights to hear them speak without himself speaking anything. And if you remember how Krishna was so much patient to explain everything to Arjuna, even Arjuna was speaking like a fool. In this way, being always tolerant of others and appreciating their points of view, it will be easy for us to convince them gradually to join us. So letter to Balwant, December 13, 1972. This is such a profound letter and you know, we could have a whole class on this, but I'll speak, highlight three points from this letter. First thing Prabhupada says, they deserve to be puffed up. He's talking about people who are wealthy or famous or educated or successful. So they are successful in, by, their, by their definition of success. And Prabhupada says, we need to appreciate that. Prabhupada is not here saying, for example, without Krishna, everything is zero. And whatever you achieved, it's all nonsense. No, people have achieved certain things and there are certain definitions of success in society. Somebody is very well educated. Now we may say, okay, modern education, Prabhupada said is a spiritual slaughterhouse. Well, if we say that to a person who is very well educated, actually it is we who are being spiritual slaughterers. Because Whatever be the deficiencies of modern education, it requires hard work. It requires talent. And somebody who has been successful in that, they have certain, certain ability, certain uh, diligence, and we need to respect them for that. So Prabhupada said they deserve to be puffed up. Prabhupada is not saying say pride is a demoniac quality. They are the, they're spiritually ignorant. Respect them for what they have achieved in their terms. And then we need to learn learn the art of how to approach a higher class of men. So Prabhupada is not saying you just have to go and teach them. You have to learn how to teach them. That means we need to learn from our audience how they think. Just because we know what is right doesn't mean we know the right way to present it. We need to talk with people, not to them. To them means or talk down to them. You know, I know the truth. You are ignorant. Here I am to enlighten you. No, there has to be an exchange. So we need to, 
we need to learn from them how we can share spiritual wisdom with them so probably the onus is on us to learn the art and why is all this important because this is the background for understanding what it means to speak according to or to, or to present the wisdom according to time place circumstance so it is now what is the time place circumstance who is going to teach us can we just observe and learn well we can to some extent but prabhupad spent time in america in the early days at least trying to understand the way american way of life so our audience will teach us and prabhupad says we need to learn the art of how to approach and lastly we could say from it's a, such a radical perspective prabhupad said this is right this is wrong anybody who says anything wrong is a fool and a rascal that's the conception of prabhupad we have had but prabhupad is saying appreciating their point of view points of view now we may say this is wrong but i know what is right because i know what is scriptural teaching but prabhupad is saying appreciate their point of view so don't just view their view we we can't just judge their view point from our perspective this person is a materialist this person is a atheist this person is a mayavadi this person is a sergia this person is a whatever it is sometimes our philosophy just becomes like a bag for us to pop out labels and fix uh, dismissive labels on people so instead of judging their view point we to understand why do they think the way they do if we actually want to connect with them rather than evaluating their thoughts we need to understand their thinking what is the way people are thinking why are they thinking in this way and how can i uh, okay this is the way they think then how can i present to them the spiritual message in the way they think so prabhupada also says in the first canto that realization means to present things in a way that is interesting to the audience so now what is interesting to the audience how will we know that and we could say humor and jokes and entertainment well, that's one thing which interests but are we really giving spiritual stuff over there that might be a part of some presentation but within what we have to give how can we address how can we interest them that's the important question so this brings me uh, to appreciating their point of view what does it mean so if we consider living outreach according to time place circumstance what does it mean so here you will see a tradition is something which comes from the past and the contemporary world is like a disk below and the ball at the center is the living tradition so the living tradition is connected to the past the tradition as it is existed in the past by fidelity fidelity that is faithfulness and the living tradition is connected to the contemporary world by flexibility and these two together enable a person and enable the tradition to stay living so fidelity keeps us connected with the past flexibility keeps us connected with the current situation now in every moment there are conservatives and liberals we could say broadly the conservatives are concerned with fidelity we need to stay faithful to the way things were done in the past and liberals are considered concerned with flexibility we need to make sure that whatever we want to teach is accessible to others so now if there is only fidelity without flexibility then what happens the tradition becomes like a museum piece mm -hmm. there's no way we can uh, actually reach out to people because we, say if prabhupad went to america and gave classes in sanskrit or bengali if he had not been flexible to speak in english he people would have treated him like a curiosity object or strange swami has come from india but he would not have been much more than a museum exhibit on the other hand if there's only flexibility and no fidelity then what happens we just become a fashion trend we just become a part of the contemporary landscape the connection with the tradition is lost but when there is fidelity and flexibility both together that's where there's a living tradition that's where there is a living tradition so now if we consider the living tradition how does it work we see now as i said we could have generations 1960 was the prabhupad 1920 was around the time when bakshas talk was preaching was at its peak 1890s was the time when bakshas you know talk was preaching was a peak now of course they preach for several decades but i am just taking one representative decade so now every acharya has done things which are required for connecting with the people of their times so for example bhakti not thakur what did he do he did many radical things but one thing was he was the first person in our tradition to write novels now there are works of uh, works of drama which are profusely written in our tradition Uh, but novel 
was not written. In fact, the genre of literature called novel, which is so novel, so common now, it was not very common in the past. And when from when Western people came to India and they started colonizing India, and Indians started getting educated in the Western way of living, and Bhaktuno Thakur wrote novels like uh, Jaiva Dharma, like Prema Pradeep, and in that way he used the genre of fiction to convey wisdom, convey devotional wisdom. Now nobody had done it in the past. Now, why did he do it? Because that is the exhibition of flexibility. The message was the same uh, as in the past. The message was of Gaudiya Vaishnavism, but he made a genre of literature which is flexibility. Uh, flexibility in terms of he used a novel. Now, if you go back further to the time of Chaitanya Charitamrit, in the Chaitanya Charitamrit, they said that a devotee should be a kavi, a devotee should be a poet. Now, is it that all of us, if we can't write poetry, then we can't be devotees? No, what is the point over there? Now, Kavi can mean a philosopher also, but clearly in Chaitanya Charitamrut, it is referring to poetry. So the point is, when Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and his followers were there in Bengal, at that time, Kavya and Natya, poetry and drama, were very popular, very influential in Bengali culture. And the devotees, they learned, they were expert in this genre of poetry and drama, dramaturgy, and they wrote dramas. Jagannath Priya Natakam, Chaitanya Chandrodai Natakam, and so many other things like that. They wrote poetry, they wrote drama, and they made Chaitan, they made the teachings of Gaudiya Vaishnavism accessible to people. So now, uh, even now today, dramas are uh, useful, but they're not that popular as they were. So now, so to understand what is the culture at a particular time, and what is appealing to people at that time, and to present the wisdom accordingly. That's the intelligence of an Acharya. Now, if you consider Bhakti Sanjit Thakur, he also did many things. Let's focus on this one thing. This is theistic exhibitions. Now, what were these theistic exhibitions? There are huge exhibitions in which one part of it was directly spiritual and a large part of it was, almost half or more of it was from, from a critical perspective, it was, it was mundane. What was mundane? He, he invited prominent educationists, scientific researchers, social developers to come and exhibit. So latest developments in science and technology were exhibited over there. And we may say, what is the point of that? So, but Bhakti Sanjana Hur gave a profound example to illustrate that. So he said, suppose somebody for many generations has been going to bathe, uh, somebody's family, many generations have been going to bathe in the Ganga. They live near the Ganga and the Ganga is maybe a half a kilometer away from them and they go to bathe there. And this person learns, okay, I should go and bathe in the Ganga. But then uh, for us, rivers are big, powerful things and we think this is where the river is. But if you look at the history of the world, rivers change paths. And sometimes entire civilizations can die or emerge just because of a river changing its path. So if the Ganga changes its path, and say the person was living here and the Ganga was here. So the, pers the person's ancestors would go to bathe over there. But now the Ganga is over flowing from here. And if the person simply goes there again, where the Ganga was earlier flowing and just goes and stands over there. Uh, well, there's no water over there. Is that person really bathing in the Ganga? He says, if you want to bathe in the Ganga, you have to go where the Ganga is. Not simply go where your ancestors have gone. So he gave this example in different contexts for different purposes. In, in our context, what it means is that we need to go where the Ganga is flowing. If we want to share Krishna's message, we need to go in the area where people are interested and present Krishna's message over there. So like last time also I talked about Niyamagraha, sticking to the letter of the law without, without understanding the purpose of the law. The letter of the law is, okay, go there and bathe. But there's no water over there, no Ganga over there. What is the point of going there? So Bhakti, not, so Bhakti Thakur's mood was that these theistic exhibitions were, yes, people are attracted by science and technology. Let them come to see science and technology. And then while it is there, the devotees will be there. You know, here there's a devotional exhibition also. And he would also have attracted dioramas. And they were impressive to see artistically at that time. And people, people who would never come directly to just see a religious exhibition or a religious festival, they came for that, what we could call secular exhibition 
and next to that was a religious ex- or a devotional exhibition and they came for that also so this was something which is not done but bhakti 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 sans thakur sensed the mood of the times and he said okay this is what you are attracted to material progress okay we'll have material progress and spiritual progress rev- uh, avenues being displayed side by side so similarly for sishila prabhupad now he did many things one of the extraordinary things was he did was he started a bhakti vedanta institute that was meant for scientific outreach and in general for academic outreach for outreach to scholarly kind of people now science as a genre of knowledge itself was not there uh, before 200 years now we could say science as a way of looking at things that's fine a systematic way of looking at things we could call that science but the word sci- newton never called called himself a scientist he called himself a natural philosopher so it was in the late 18th late, uh, late 18th early 19th century that the word science was first used for those who were doing the work of natural philosophers so because that was not so relevant we don't see jeev goswami or vishwanath thakur directly talking about science per se now we could say that that they even vedic spiritual knowledge is also science that's true but the specific terminology and the specific methodology of uh, rational empirical based approach we don't see that so much because that's a particular way of looking at things so prabhupad noticed that and prabhupad said we'll have a special institute and prabhupad actually wanted to spend a he he invested a lot of money to have the first international conference on science and spirituality and there it was like uh, scientists from all over the world were invited and they came and all that happened none of the scientists became devotees they just discussed whether the whether consciousness comes from matter or whether consciousness comes from something else and prabhupad said that if they just appreciate prabhupad said is bhaktivan institute is meant to increase the prestige of iskon so prabhupad now prabhupad did many other things also which uh, which were new ways in which he ensured that that message of the tradition reached the contemporary world so now if we consider we are in 2020 now 20 21st century 20 2010 20, 2020 now what is required for today's world that is what you know the current teachers of the tradition think deeply and they so when i talked about being faithful to the tradition there are two aspects be there is fidelity but the tradition itself has an aspect of flexibility so if somebody is only faithful to the fidelity aspect of the tradition i'll stay connected with the past that's good but a part of the tradition is staying connected with the present and that staying connected with the present requires flexibility so flexibility being flexible is not a compromise being flexible is an integral part of the tradition so it's very important one being flexible is not a compromise being flexible is an integral and essential part of the tradition and far from saying that being if somebody is flex well they are compromising we would say or they are deviating somebody who is not being flexible you know we could say that maybe they are not faithful to the complete whole of the tradition because the tradition includes flexibility so now what is happening in 2020 now this may seem a little bit long theoretical background but it is important to understand many of the things that are being done by zolans radhanath maharaj for outreach in today's world so every epoch every age has its own ethos ethos is its prominent way of thinking so if we consider pre modern times people's primary authority was scripture in india it was the vedas in the west it was the bible maybe in the middle east it was the quran people had faith in scripture then the modern times came and scripture was replaced by science and science became the authority of people now today what we live in is called a post modern times although everyone uses the product of science technology now people don't necessarily think that science is the source of undiluted good for the world unadulterated good for the world so so in the post modern times there is no no real people don't really accept scripture as authority people use science but they don't accept science as necessarily authority for knowing what is the ultimate good for us so then what what is the authority it is experience experience means if something works for you i am interested in it tell me 
I would like to learn about it. If something works for me, I will do it. So experience is what is considered a source of authority or authenticity in today's world. And this also leads to different ways of outreach. Now, we could say probably there are three different ways. There's prescriptive. Do this, don't do this. It's like a doctor giving prescription. Eat this, don't eat this. Normative is a more moral level. This is right, this is wrong. Now, in the postmodern world, neither prescriptive nor normative work very well. Why? Because people don't really accept authorities. There are, uh, there are huge books written on, on, say, on reaching out to postmodern audience. So for example, a simple example to illustrate these three points. Say if, uh, if there's a church and they are doing counseling for uh, marriage counseling for young couples or training them for a living married life and say a, a seasoned couple comes there and says, they start giving a talk and they say that anybody who divorces will go to hell. The immediate response of the postmodern audience is, you go to hell, I don't care about you. So getting divorced is wrong. Who says it is wrong? But on the other hand, the same couple says, you know, we have been married together happily for the last 30 years. And we'd like to share how we did it. Yes, we want to know. That's a descriptive approach. So descriptive approach connects with people very easily. If we want to tell, if somebody asks us, why don't you eat meat? Now, if you tell them you shouldn't eat meat, he says, who are you telling me that? If you say, meat eating is brutal. It is all killing of animals. It is only a heartless person will do that. What? You are judging me? They just turn off. But instead you say, I don't know, actually when I came to know uh, how much violence happens in the, in the production of meat, I felt that I don't want to be a part of it. That's why I don't eat meat. So we are not threatening them. We are not compromising our truth. We're just presenting it differently. So journey home is that kind of descriptive way of outreach. So the way people think has changed substantially in the last, even from the time when Shila Prabhupada was there. So uh, to understand how people think and then to see how to present accordingly, that is the expertise of contemporary teachers. And it's not only Ranath Maharaj is doing this. There are many other of our leaders also who are trying in different ways. Devamath Maharaj has been quite successful in his own ways in uh, New Zealand. Shivaram Maharaj is doing in, in Europe. And then uh, there are devotees in South America who are quite successful. There are different devotees who are trying different things. And uh, they're being resourceful in their own ways to do things. In Russia, there are devotees who, in, who, many devotees use Ayurveda and other things like that to attract people and then they bring people further closer to Krishna. And they do it in America also. But basically, take people who are interested in material health and bring them to spiritual health. So the idea is flexibility. That's integral for what is required for our tradition. So now, okay, sorry. So as I said, few things convince people as much as personal testimony in today's world, in the postmodern ethos. And this is not non-conventional. This is now Narad Muni himself tells his autobiography, we could say, to Vyasadev, how I came to Krishna consciousness. He teaches, the, he teaches the principles of bhakti and then he teaches his own example. That's chapters 4, 5 and 6 of the first canto. So, and I'm one of the editors for Back to Godhead. And Back to Godhead, one of the most popular columns is how I came. How I came, HIC we call it, how I came to Krishna consciousness. Because people are interested in people. People are much more interested in people than they are in concepts. So if those concepts are demonstrated through people's lives, people can connect with them very easily. And that is a part of the tradition. That's why the Puranas and the Itihasas are far more widely read than the Upanishads. Because the Upanishads are about concepts. The Puranas and the Itihasas are about people. Uh, people living and embodying those concepts. So that journey home. Now... We'll talk about a couple of things more. So now, one thing I talked about is the postmodern ethos. So appreciate their points of view. This is I'm the whole talk is building on that point. Prabhupada says appreciate their points of view. So what does it mean? Understand where people are at, why they think like that, 
and then present accordingly we learn the art of how to present to them so the autobiographical experiential way of presenting is appreciating their point of view and then presenting apart from that uh, we may say that the world is becoming more materialistic kaliyuga is becoming worse that is true but at the same time there are some areas in which consciousness is rising so you could say some indicators indications of the rise of sattva in the western world and there are broadly four so yoga mindfulness veganism and environmentalism and each of them is making people explore something more than immediate gratification something beyond say environmentalism means we are not just meant to dominate the planet and enjoy it veganism means people are conscious that we are killing animals we don't want to a lot of people have mental problems but rather than simply popping pills to deal with mental problems is there something understanding oneself better can we do that now yoga is of course very big now all of these are broadly opportunities for us to present krishna 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 wisdom krishna wisdom krishna wisdom through it so veganism you know we have cooking classes environmentalism the many devotees are doing uh, in hungary we have a uh, a farm now here gokardhan ecology has something in mindfulness there are devotees we are not really Uh, done much in it buddhism has taken that up but there's a lot of scope to tap mindfulness and yoga is very big so when i was talking with holens radhanath maharaj in chicago once so he mentioned to me that yoga today is exactly like counter culture was during prabhupad's times so prabhupad sometimes would use negative words in a positive context so for example prabhupad would say that a devotee is an opportunist the opportunist means sometimes if you say opportunist means it's a negative thing they're just grabbing an opportunity but prabhupada would say that wherever there's an opportunity for serving krishna devotee grabs that so prabhupada when he went to america you know he was staying with the like a respectable middle class people uh, uh, initially in butler and then he came to this upstate uh, he came to new york in the heart of new york where yoga mishra yoga studio was there but there people were not really spiritually interested they were more interested in health at that time but then prabhupad saw that the hippies in the counter culture they are more spiritually interested so prabhupad went there in fact if somebody made a movie of prabhupad's life a, a person who had never even drunk tea or coffee in his life a person who had never broken a single regulatory principle that person going and living among people who, whose only regulatory principle was to break break all the regulatory principles you couldn't imagine a movie like that but prabhupad did that So now, if we consider what did Prabhupada see in the counterculture, he said that they had appreciation. They were interested in spirituality, and especially they were appreciative of Indian spirituality, Eastern spirituality. Many of the hippies they had fascination with India. Some of some some of Prabhupada's early disciples they were the hippies, but they had already been to India. Now yoga also people are appreciating Eastern spirituality. They they experience some health benefits because of yoga, and then they say, "What is this?" Some of them at least become open to what is this. all about what is this a higher tradition about now both in the counter culture they were seeking something beyond the ordinary now in that case they were considering oh the ordinary way of life living is not so you know, the education culture the politics it all is hypocritical now in yoga people may not be that against the mainstream but still they are in one sense looking for something beyond the mainstream something alternative they just don't want to again put pills in their body to become healthier they want a more holistic more natural way to become healthier now there is a flip side of it that in the counter culture people were deeply into drugs now in the yoga we can say people are deep in bodily consciousness but at the very least even in bodily consciousness people are ready to be a part of part of uh, follow some disciplines uh, regulate themselves for some time and we could say counter culture and taking drugs it is not really it's very difficult to conceive of it in any way as a part of vedic culture somebody could make a stretch and say that yes in indian culture also naga the some of shiva worshippers they take charas and that's something similar to taking lsd or the other drugs so we could say it is like at the fringes or borders of vedic culture or vedic wisdom but yoga is much more central to vedic wisdom so just as prabhupad used the counter culture 
today we can use yoga and yogis are receptive to spirituality you may say they are in bodily consciousness well yes but who isn't in bodily consciousness in today's world if you want people who are not in bodily consciousness you know we will hardly find anyone like that but what is the opportunity that we are in yoga use people's bodily consciousness to take them beyond bodily consciousness that if devotees teach yoga and through that they teach them yoga wisdom and they teach them you now patanjali yoga sutra is often been interpreted as impersonalistic but if you look at the actual sutras and we look at the traditional commentaries there is a there is a reasonable ground for saying that it is theistic it is devotional and bhagavad gita is quite devotional bhagavad gita is also considered a standard yoga book so it's a opportunity right there for us and now if we don't tap it somebody else will tap it now we could take some statements of prabhupad prabhupad might say that you know we are we have no interest in yoga now that is not the only thing that prabhupad has said in prabhupad in south america the devotee said people are interested in yoga over here and we said that's good you know let them tell them what is the ultimate yoga one of prabhupad's books name was perfection of yoga so this prabhupad did speak negatively about yoga at times if yoga was only about bodily consciousness but if from bodily consciousness one can come to spiritual consciousness then why not it's an opportunity very much there and if as i said if we don't tap it somebody else will and unfortunately that has already happened uh in many ways prabhupada was the first person to really introduce kirtan big time in the west mm-hmm. now many other spiritual teachers went from india and they sometimes uh, composed some songs sang some songs but they never they were not bhakti teachers and they didn't do kirtan the way prabhupada did and now if you see in the western world kirtan has become quite big and although within our movement we have many good kirtaniers some very well known kirtaniers but if you look at the mainstream kirtan circle you know is gone which started it is nowhere there because we somehow we various reasons i won't want to go into that but we just didn't explore that opportunity sufficiently there has to be certain amount of flexibility broadness maybe do certain things to reach out to a broader number of people if you don't do that then where there's a possibility somebody else will take it so they may use what is a part of our culture to to spread something which is different from our culture so the opportunity when it is there it has to be tapped and so now uh, along with the bhakti center and there are other places where yoga outreach there is super soul farm where the yoga outreach is happening through different devotees and they come to govardhan eco village and here they get exposed to they they do yoga but they also get exposed to bhakti yoga and so many people who would otherwise never turn toward bhakti are actually uh, very very receptive to bhakti and they are coming closer and closer so through yoga to bhakti is probably the biggest channel we have for reaching out to western people and then that brings me to the last part of what i'll talk about is that when we started our movement there were some some definition of success that prabhupad used he talked about three things how many books are distributed how many temples were built and how many devotees were made and he, and these are very important definitions of success and if we consider uh, the radha gopna temple you know they the, the and the the books distributed are significant then the large number of devotees are being made we see thousands and thousands of devotees coming to the yatras which is one sadhana maharaj takes to mayapur and vrindavan and the holy places as far as temples being built from mumbai devotees have preached in all parts of maharashtra and now devotees are going across the world but there so according to the conventional definitions of success also there has been a significant amount of success however at the same time prabhupad also till 1970 almost in the early 1970s he said that now it is time to boil the milk now what does boiling the milk mean if we are boiling the milk what would be the definition of success at that time would we have the same definition of success that how many books distributed how many temples built how many devotees made no if we want to take people closer to krishna deeper in their spiritual lives then we need different definitions of success so as a movement itself we have diversified for example now we have bhakti shastri courses we have educational institutes and now if devotees get bhakti shastri degrees is that not a step forward in their spiritual life it is but where would it fall in these three definitions of success 
well it's not just after books are distributed books have to be read and understood so we need to expand our definitions of success based on what is required so for example now uh, let's take prabhupad's uh, study the bhakti vedanta institute now prabhupad as i said he's put a lot of effort in the last years uh, he was would spend time with bhakti sarodha damodar maharaj who was his prime scientist disciple and uh, he, now if you see it would not fall any of this bhakti vedanta institute may not make devotees it may not distribute books directly it may not build temples and the point was prabhupad emphasized certain definitions but prabhupad also was uh, was open to and also emphasize other aspects of bhakti also other definitions of success also so now prabhupad said that the bhakti vedanta institute is like is meant to increase the prestige of iskon so if scientists come and appreciate then that can open the doors for a lot more people to at least start thinking about okay maybe this this devotee this hari krishna stuff is not just religious hocus pocus it is not just sentimental maybe there is some substance here so in some ways govardhan eco village is doing what the bhakti vedanta institute is doing it is enhance even if it is doing even if we are doing nothing else it is enhancing the prestige of iskon you know we uh, the govardhan eco village has done dozens and dozens of awards and international awards in fact at one time uh the award that we won was so rare that the govardhan eco village that that's the time when the indian indian government took notice of us the maharashtra government indian government what is the govardhan eco village you know we don't know about it but the world knows about it and they are they were awarding this village so the kind of uh, achievements in terms of good pr that has been done that is remarkable now these are actually you could say in some ways three things about this this will be my concluding point that it is attracts people who won't come to a temple i mentioned this point yesterday last time also but it's a whole demographic of people who would not who would not be religiously inclined but still they are open to something like this so do we not want to if we are compassionate should we not try to reach out to those people also or is our just like lord jagannath comes out of the temple to give his darshan to people who don't come to the temple so similarly that means lord jagannath is also wanting to give his compassion to those who are not ready to come to the traditional channels of receiving compassion so people who don't come to temples people who may not take books when you distribute them on the streets but if they come to eco village they meet devotees they see the temple they have a cultural experience we are reaching a whole group of people who would not be reached otherwise it's a futuristic project we know that when shri prabhupad started the juhu temple it was in a remote part of mumbai now today that is the prime estate of mumbai but the devotees thought this is so far away and who is going to come here there's no point in having a temple and the devotees actually cancelled the land deal with mr n and prabhupad was furious and prabhupad actually had to exercise exert himself to try to get the land back so the devotees now they were very dedicated but they just didn't have the vision that prabhupad had same way with mayapur when prabhupad got the land prabhupad came and he put his walking stick on the ground he said this will be our international headquarters and the devotees with him looked around and they said as far as they could see they couldn't see a single human being they were just overgrown sugarcane fields this international headquarters is couldn't make sense of it but prabhupad had the vision so now we may feel that actually speaking you know so much money is being spent on the gorodhan eco village so much effort is going in what is the result well if we had asked the amount of money which was spent on mayapur maybe 30 40 years ago and what was the result well at that time in any venture the initi- any big project the, the results don't come immediately they take time so it's a futuristic project which will attract people and then they have they have abundant opportunity for spiritual experiences and what may not be known is that from the govardhan eco village there are hundreds and hundreds of uh, program that are happening and hundreds of and even thousands of people are becoming devotees in the nearby villages there are very active uh, social development hap- initiatives happening there are very active spiritual outreach happening in fact the the rural devotees from here go to their own yatras and sometimes they have several thousand people going for yatras their yatra is different from radha maharaj yatra so there is direct spiritual outreach also is happening which may not be visible for us but the overall point is 
it's an expanded definition of success and in this way so the ho- whole theme of today's talk was that we appreciate others points of view that means we appreciate what the mood what the conceptions what the ethos of people in today's world is and then we present krishna bhakti accordingly so that is what his holiness radhanath maharaj is doing and that is what as a faithful follower of shila prabhupad he is taking the mantle of doing that so that special prabhupad's mission remains not only vibrant but spreads further and further to domains where it would otherwise not reach so i'll summarize and then we can take a few questions mm. so i talked about three main points today but one one theme with three applications of the theme one theme was we talked about the prabhupad quote three things within that you know, if people are puffed up they deserve it if they are successful in their lives then we need to learn how to present uh, how to present krishna consciousness to them and professor we should appreciate their point of view and tolerate them so now so what does that mean in terms of today's application so we talked about every tradition has flexibility and fidelity fidelity keeps it connected with the past flexibility with the current so bhakti no thakur was flexible in terms of he was the first person to write a novel in our tradition bhakti sanat thakur was flexible he started the theistic exhibition prabhupada was flexible he started the bhakti gandhi institute so radhanath maharaj is flexible and what is his flexibility i talked about the post modern ethos where people don't really consider science, scripture or science as authority but they consider personal experience as authority so normative or prescriptive outreach doesn't work descriptive works so journey home is exactly like that reaching out to those people then what are people's interests people want to improve their health in holistic ways without with the medically intrusive ways so yoga is their approach so tap that opportunity of yoga use people's bodily consciousness raise them above bodily consciousness i talked about sattva rising and four ways yoga mindfulness veganism and environmentalism and all of them can be tapped and then lastly i talked about you know so the govardhan eco village is like the bhaktivan institute if we expand the definitions of success uh, <clears throat> what does that mean that means not just books distributed temples built devotees met that's important but bhaktivan institute was meant to increase the prestige of iskon so that people mind will open and they will appreciate more and more so similarly Gorodhani College simply by winning so many awards has brought so much prestige for our movement, and then beyond that, also we talked about how it's a futuristic project, and like uh, Mayapur and Juhu were for the devotees, they couldn't appreciate it. And lastly, I talked about how we, if we understand uh, the long-term vision, then we can appreciate how whatever is being done is actually meant to carry forward Prabhupada's mission. and carry it to people who would not normally uh, be reached by that mission so thank you very much hare krishna mm-hmm. thank you very much prabhu for bringing this beautiful points so now kanvanand prabhu you have some questions or did you send to prabhu some questions you can Prabhu, would you like to read, or should I read it for you, Prabhu? Yeah, I can, I can read them out. Yes, I'll do that. Yes, okay, Prabhu. Thank you. So, there are some questions which came earlier on the earlier to us, and I'll answer also uh, the questions which are here also. So, now when we see differences among, um, so when we see differences among uh, senior disciples of Shri Prabhupad, who are uh, who are also Maharaj, Maharaj is a dedicated. Followers of Prabhupada, the exalted devotee. Then the, some of the devotees criticizing him are also exalted. So can we see this as transcendental differences? Say in the spiritual world, there is a differences between there are differences between Radha Rani and Chandra Vali, and both of their differences are for pleasing Krishna. So they they just have a different vision of how to serve Krishna. Can we see it this way? Yes, that's a very healthy way of looking at it, and it's a very devotionally sweet way of looking at it also. both are concerned about pleasing krishna they just have a different mood of how to please krishna uh, <clears throat> having said that we have to be careful about how things are actually manifesting in real life that means uh, if uh, somebody is speaking some things which is damaging our faith disturbing our mind and maybe even destroying our devotion then it is our responsibility to protect it 
So yes, we can keep a distance and keep a respectful distance. If it's we are already disturbed, then ask some senior devotees to clarify to get some clarification. So we don't have to. Uh, we don't have to uh, make it a campaign to um, to get into conflicts where we don't need to so it's best to see that yes there are differences at a higher level and those differences will be resolved at that level and if we keep practicing bhakti then we can move ahead in our spiritual life this has been there uh, these differences are not new if we see after chaitanya mahaprabhu departed there was there was like a almost like a seismic quake like a earthquake at the heart of gaudiya vaishnavism because gaudiya vaishnavism almost fractured into two groups the group of nityanand prabhu and the group of advaita acharya now now nityanand prabhu and advaita acharya had a had a unusual relationship they would seem to quarrel with each other and it was sweet and transcendental but somehow some of their followers thought that actually they have real differences and because of that what happened was that nityanand prabhu some of dan prabhu's followers some of them said that nityanand prabhu is the real successor and some of the other acharya followers said that actually advaita acharya is a real successor in fact advaita acharya's own son became a campaigner for a heresy that because it was advaita acharya's call that god chaitanya mahaprabhu descend so therefore advaita acharya is more powerful than chaitanya mahaprabhu and therefore he should be the successor of chaitanya mahaprabhu how advaita acharya and chaitanya mahaprabhu had their own sorry advaita acharya and nitanand prabhu had their own relationship uh, but the unnecessary things became things started becoming very uh, tense and very somewhat bitter that's why we have in chaitanya bhagavat strong statements if two devotees are having conflicts don't take sides just pursue your especially two senior devotees are having conflicts don't take side just pursue your bhakti now of course if somebody is directly damaging our faith then we may need to do what it takes to protect our faith but don't make it into a issue for campaigning and uh, escalating the conflict so i think uh, now so maharaj accepts um, disciples however they are practicing krishna consciousness and uh, but we may sometimes need strong doses for growing spiritually um and that's why some of maharaj's earlier classes which were somewhat stronger now he's a little softer so how do we avoid becoming lazy and complacent uh and stay enthusiastic if maharaj is happy with the level we are practicing well that's a interesting question mm. there are two different things over here one is accepting and the other is expecting prabhupada was asked do you love all your disciples equally and prabhupada said yes and then he added but if you come forward but if somebody comes forward to take responsibility i reciprocate that means that yes prabhupada loves all his disciples equally but he has carrying the whole mission of lord chaitanya mission of lord krishna it's like a huge burden if somebody comes forward in assisting then prabhupada is very pleased the prabhupada at one time said that if anybody is a member of iskon i never displeased with any member of iskon i am happy that you are at least being a part of the krishna conscious movement but then prabhupada will be happier if somebody is an active member serving and assisting in the mission so same way Uh, there so maharaj is very accepting of everyone whatever level we are is happy with that but he has a deep desire to sh- carry on prabhupada's mission and spread it far and wide so actually he he would be delighted if we become more dedicated we become more pure hearted we become more vigorous in our outreach so he may or may not articulate his expectation to us but naturally it's the, the expectation is that we all grow in our spiritual life so we need to rather than simply focus on the tone of the lectures mm-hmm. we can look at maharaj's own example like i said last time you know why does maharaj in his uh, in his 76 60 70s now 
have to start doing western outreach or work on western outreach he could just just happily be in india give classes be appreciated and uh, and um, have many more hundreds and thousands of disciples more he is not doing that because he is taking that he is doing that sacrifice for uh, carrying forward the prabhupad's mission so if we want inspiration uh, we needn't just look at maharaj's uh, classes yes they are soft but uh, there is if we look at it he is example he is he doing a lot of outreach and if you look if we talk with some of his uh, dedicated uh, disciples we'll find that uh, mm, he expects a lot from them so if somebody wants to come close to him and be like a, a, a become a become a trustworthy assistant the price is high the price is high the gorang prabhu always says speaks that normally if people get association with the spiritual master for a few minutes also they are happy but he says if maharaj gives me a call sometimes my anxiety increases what does maharaj want from me at one time i was um, as i mentioned i was uh, editing the journey within book and then so maharaj had emailed me the book and i had gone through it and then i came to mumbai for a weekend class from pune and then so i had written written back an email and i had suggested certain things some certain things which could be it could be uh, change in some ways so uh, i met maharaj after his sunday fees class so maharaj said are you staying here for some time i said maharaj if you want i'll be happy to stay maharaj yes you know yes we can work on that book so then we worked for a few days on the book and then it was i think uh, wednesday or something like that i'd come on sunday so we uh, worked for quite some several hours on several days in wednesday evening maharaj told me at around 7 o'clock that okay so tomorrow morning i am sending the book to the publisher can you do one one last proofreading of the whole book now it was like 300 page book and it was already 7 o'clock at night so i said okay maharaj i'll do it at whole night i was awake and i was doing proofreading and then you now the previous days also i had been quite tired so i just uh, i I fell asleep while I was proofreading, and I smashed my head on the computer, and my computer screen cracked. And then, and then I finally completed, and Maharaj was quite happy with it. Then I told Gorang Prabhu about this, and what had happened? He said, Gorang Prabhu said, "For me, last ten years have been like this. This is, this is so. If we really want to, sir, and it's not now. Gorang Prabhu is working very closely with Maharaj, but if you look at many other disciples of Maharaj, Radheshyam Prabhu is working very hard. They may not be directly working with Maharaj." but he has a tremendous preaching spirit we see other senior disciples they may not be involved in projects but the way they extend themselves to spend time with people to counsel them to guide them to encourage them so everybody is extending themselves according to their capacity as those who want to be dedicated to maharaj so we rather than focusing only on the uh, on the tone in the classes we can look at the living examples and take inspiration from there Mm. So, okay. There's one. So in New Vrindavan, Maharaj surrendered to authority beyond limitations of health and ego. now maharaj expects us to cooperate with authority but not to surrender please explain well i don't know whether maharaj has specifically said that devotee should not surrender um but uh what i would say is yeah it could not that not surrender but that level of surrender is uh, not necessarily required at present when maharaj has asked at one time no is he planning to write a book about about his experiences in the krishna consciousness movement so maharaj said that and if i write a book like that people who came after reading the first book will go away after reading the second book it is a extraordinary phase and uh, 
in many ways the demands on the body and the mind were were extreme so in some ways that was a time of great explosion of the movement as hegel proposed it in the book called the hari krishna explosion so prabhupad was uh, prabhupad in many ways channeled the rajoguna of his young disciples and he, he triggered the adventurer within them the prabhupad would sometimes have a globe in his room and he would tell his disciples all of you pick one one country and go and deliver that country Jindal Rani Vajpati was one of the young disciples of Shri Prabhupada that time. He said, Prabhupada, what about us girls? And Prabhupada said, you know, we are all souls. We are not boys or girls. You also pick one country and go and deliver it. So Prabhupada, you know, like he fired the imagination of his disciples with the spirit of adventure for serving Krishna. And so we could say the Rajas was used in Krishna's service. So now as a movement, we are, we are, uh, we are trying to come more towards sattva guna so that we can be more sustainable so the beginning of a movement is in beginning of anything is in the mode of passion that's creation but sustenance requires goodness so we want to practice in a way that is sustainable many of shri prabhupada's disciples often have see severe health problems now and i have talked with many of them and they said that if we had taken a little more care of our health when we were young we would have been able to do so much more for krishna now so yes we are we also need to surrender in fact just chanting hari krishna every day requires surrender practicing the principles of bhakti requires surrender but we could say there are degrees of surrender and we may not be expected to surrender at that level of degree at that level as it was at that time that's because you know, we want to do it in the long run we want to continue we know that shri prabhupada's times the movement spread very rapidly but you know it also was not sustainable after prabhupada departed Uh, we never had like very ex- very extensive statistics of everything but according to some statistics all 90% of prabhupada's disciples couldn't continue their bhakti after prabhupad left in the next decade or so they left many of them of course continued practicing something and many of them have came back to varying degrees to krishna lotus feet but it was not sustainable so we want to practice bhakti in a way that is that is intense but that is also sustainable so that's what is being recommended when it says don't be that uh, we don't have to, we have to surrender but not to that de- that degree which is not sustainable mm. so sometimes in western outreach we don't get much success if we had been in india and if we do outreach program and lots of people come in the west not many people come so how to avoid becoming discouraged and if we have to do alone everything it also becomes a disheartening so yes it's a challenge that's why it's good to have some kind of uh, virtual networking at least with other devotees who are doing western outreach otherwise it can be like a solitary toil it can become exhausting as you rightly said so try to find out other devotees who are involved in similar outreach try to learn from their experiences share your experiences and uh, try to get strength from that so sometimes we may have to reconceptualize our definitions of success so we see that bhakti sans thakur at one time prabhupad was asked that bhakti sans thakur preached in bengal bhakti sans thakur preached in india and you preach all over the world therefore you are greater than all of them prabhupad said don't never think like this it is by their blessings that i have been able to do what i have been able to do uh, so he that was prabhupad's humility but also the reality is that you know when prabhupad came to america there was a certain amount of receptivity it was not like a ready made audience prabhupad had to break through various levels of resistance resistance but at least they were interested during bhakti sans thakur's time india was in constant political turmoil because of the struggle for independence and pakistan sarkar convinced prabhupad to rise above the independence struggle and focus on bhakti but but so many other people were just caught in that struggle at that time they were completely captivated by that and within that environment what bhakti sans thakur's gaudiya mat was able to achieve is remarkable it might not have been as extensive as what bhakti prabhupad achieved so in that context it's remarkable 
So that means that we have to see, we have to, we cannot apply the standard of definition of success from one age to another age, because each age has its own challenges. So just as we cannot compare in a in a literal sense the level of success of Bhaktivinoda Thakur and Bhaktivinoda Thakur or Anshila Prabhupada. There were, there were different ages with different challenges. Similarly, we cannot compare the level of we can uh, the literally we can't compare success in India with success in America or success in Europe anywhere else. So to give an example, suppose somebody is there two people are dancing. Hmm? Uh, so suppose one person is dancing on a dance floor, which is uh, which is very smooth and very conducive for dancing. Another person is dancing on the dance floor, which is littered with oil and glass, broken glass. They're slipping and bleeding. And if they continue to dance, even dancing here for, for five minutes actually might be a more laudable achievement than dancing on that, uh, that smooth, that comfortable floor for 15 minutes, half an hour. So, or if you want to take a sports metaphor like cricket, some pitches are made for batting. So somebody might score a double century on a batting batter, bat, batsman's paradise. And some pitches are like batsman's graveyards. Somebody even scores a half century over there. That is might be a more, that might actually be a greater batting achievement than a double century on a batsman's paradise. So even to make one person uh, connected with Krishna in the Western world is actually far more laudable or it requires far more effort, and I won't say it's more laudable, but it is, it, is, it is a significant achievement because the pitch on which you are batting is much, much tougher. In India, actually, when we are, when we are preaching, we, we don't have to really create faith in people. All that we have to do is people have their innate piety and we just need to remove the intellectual doubts that stop of them from acting on their piety. But in the Western world, if people have that innate piety, they will go toward the religion of their birth, whether Christianity or Judaism or whatever it is. Actually, for them, if we want to reach out to Western people, we have to create faith in them. So it's a, it's a much tougher challenge. And that's why we need to know that uh, if we are doing that, we are pleasing our tradition. We are pleasing Srila Prabhupada. We are pleasing um, our spiritual master. Maharaj told me several times that where there is a need, there is greater mercy available. So he gives the example, if somebody is in a war field and they are wounded and they need one glass of water. You give them a glass of water and somebody is at home and they say, can you please give them a glass of water? You give me a glass of water. It's the same act, but it's a very different act. So you know, we, we need to see beyond the comparative definitions of success to the <clears throat> overall, overall context in which we are reaching out and, and learn, appreciate the value of what we have the opportunity to do. So both network with others and also understand it's a different field. So we appreciate accordingly the challenges. And uh, even if the progress is slow, it is laudable whatever progress is made over there. Hmm. Good question. So what, how can we be sure that if yoga and others that are introduced are not diluting the teachings of Srila Prabhupada? Yes, that's an important question. Well, how would yoga per se dilute the teachings of Srila Prabhupada? Is it that at the time of initiation, the initiation vows are being changed. Instead of chanting 16 rounds, all of you do two hours yoga sanas. Well, nobody is doing that. And nobody will even think of doing that. So, where exactly is the dilution? Uh, what, okay, for some people who are interested in yoga, there are devotees who are teaching them yoga. What, where is the dilution? Is it that in the Bhagavatam classes, we are not uh, talking about Krishna, we are only talking about yoga? Is it that no longer Prabhupada's books are being distributed? No longer Bhakti Shastri courses are being conducted? No longer Bhagavatam is being studied? Well, just because one new area of outreach is being started, how does that dilute 
the um, dilute the overall practice of bhakti yes if if from tomorrow onwards all the devotees who are doing teaching bhagavad gita teaching bhagavatam they are all told stop it all that all of you become yoga teachers and you teach yoga then then we could say there is dilution so dilution sometimes there is you know, there is like a, whenever there is a fear which is very amorphous then it's like uh, we we stay constantly fearful so if we come to a house and we fear that the house is haunted we will constantly fearful hey, wo, 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 wo. we live in par- paranoia but okay we reduce the fear okay there is there might be there might be some holes over here from which some rats might come out maybe some snakes are also in the neighborhood okay so i have to watch out for snakes i have to watch out for rats look at it and then take care of that so similarly okay dilution 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 that's a that's like a vague fear how is dilution going to happen i said one possibility is one major possibility is that we stop speaking about krishna well that's not happening now we have we have devotees <clears throat> so many we have so many courses on directly about krishna we have the bhagavat vidya peetha over here in the govardhani college and there are so many things are like that happening direct shastra is being taught now while reaching out to yoga audience yes we are speaking in a particular way but is that what we are doing to everybody in in the movement to those who are there are people who are directly interested in krishna it is krishna that is being spoken to them it is not yoga that is being spoken to them so the danger is there but rather than like doing fear mongering by talking about concept of dilution look at specific areas where it may happen and then make sure it doesn't happen so i don't see it happening anyway as such mm. but yes the concern is valid i mean to keep an eye on to keep careful well can you mention few avenues in india where areas in india where devotees can tap and introduce krishna consciousness especially in metro cities that's a big subject i would say that each city is different but broadly if we can try to make spirituality as relevant as possible for people then then there is a lot of opportunity for that in the software industry there is a lot of stress so if we can present spirituality as a way bhakti 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 spirituality is a way for helping people deal with their stress mindfulness has been presented in a big way in the western world i was I, in silicon valley one of the biggest companies salesforce and there they have actually mindfulness cabins mind the areas where if the if the employees feel stressed because something they can go and just do some mindfulness meditation over there so especially in the stressful uh, environment of the cities we can actually reach out to people like that mm. then also we can basically every city is different but if there are certain things which are important in that city if we can tap into that and then help krishna consciousness uh, at one level the city is a resource for us to share krishna consciousness but if the city sees us as a resource for them for then there will be a synergistic partnership so we have to find out what may work for people so nowadays virtual online courses are a big thing if you can customize courses and present so there's a lot that could be done i think that's a uh, it will be very specific based on time place circumstance mm. well how to avoid deviations while trying to be inclusive and broad minded example deviation in the name of being all inclusive santa claus dress from radha krishna jesus deity in temple yes now now we all want to avoid deviations but we need to clearly understand that it is not only the contemporary world that is the source of deviation 
the tradition itself can be a source of deviation also what do i mean not just the bhakti tradition but the broader vedic tradition no, no mughal invasion no christian colonialism has damaged vedic culture as much as the discriminatory caste system in india and where did the discriminatory caste system come from it came from within the tradition so it is not only broad mindedness that will lead to deviation narrow mindedness can also lead to deviation so and the danger of deviation is everywhere by being flexible we can become deviant by even by fidelity we can become deviant so fidelity is no guarantee of not becoming deviant so those who were followers now we may say that yes those who were following the caste system they were not faithful to the vedic teachings yes but they were faithful to what they thought were the vedic teachings at that time uh, so what to do so the caste as i said deviations can come from everywhere and that's why we have to see what is the purpose what is the purpose that is being served are actually people coming closer to krishna or in the name of we getting people closer to krishna we are going away from krishna so yes now some of the examples which you are giving are quite provocative say having santa claus dress for radha krishna it's difficult to, to decide and in my understanding we also need to recognize that each temple is in a different part of the world so rather than say sitting in india and judging what somebody in america is doing or what something south america south america is doing there are devotees who are sincerely trying to share krishna bhakti wherever they are and yes there are there are their authorities they are guiding them also so uh, it's best not to be like a self appointment self appointed critic for the whole movement or a self appointed watchdog we focus on our practice of bhakti if something disturbs our mind then ask someone who is responsible and uh, you know we have hari krishna mantra being sung in with rock music with western music some people might have considered that as a deviation but is that a deviation well because in the past in the tradition it has never been done with that kind of music but we are doing that we are reaching out to people so is the so what is going on over here is the hari krishna mantra not pure enough to sanctify western music western forms of music it is sometimes the hari krishna mantra may be sing sung in a tune which might be a bollywood song tune now actually it may not even be bollywood song tune it might be some tune which has been there for a long time but it became popular because of the bollywood song so now what happens is if we hear the hari krishna mantra in that tune we might be reminded of the bollywood song but for somebody who has never heard of the bollywood song they are hearing the hari krishna mantra and they are appreciating that so you know it's a difficult uh, to so we should see rather than judging Uh, everyone else you know this person is deviating here and that person is deviating there we focus on what enables us to remember krishna anukulya sa sankalpa pratikulya sa varjana and for somebody else if something helps them remember krishna they may do that and if that's wrong they have their authority is to guide them so yes deviation is a danger which everybody has to be vigilant about but it is better to be vigilant about ourselves and not become like a self appointed critic for the whole is con world i think i answered this question about flexibility for um is flexibility for new people and chastity for uh for devotees uh for serious devotees not necessarily it does it mean flexibility say speaking in english is flexibility and and studying in sanskrit is fidelity so is it that every devotee as they advance they have to learn sanskrit not necessarily i i don't think there are some simplistic formulas like this so yes each of us has to remember krishna in the best possible way we can and we have to see how best we can remember um, remember and take things forward Hmm. 
So the food distribution, the lockdown seems to be more like philanthropic activity. How is it in line with Prabhupada's teachings? <clears throat> Especially going outside and doing food for life. Well, I think I mentioned that quote by Shri Prabhupada that we say that you know we will win the hearts of people by food food distribution during this famine. So, you know, Prabhupada talked about many things. Somehow we have taken one quote of Prabhupada and uh, and used it. Prabhupada himself start food started food for life. And now different devotees may have different ideas of what are the boundaries for which food for life should be done. But we have to be, you know, we can't live in isolated bubbles, disconnected from the rest of the world. So, if we are doing, uh, if we can do scientific outreach for. Um, where there is not much tangible people becoming devotees but we are getting getting some goodwill by that then why can't we do philanthropic activity and get goodwill by that you know is it philanthropic activity like a sinful activity you no know, prabhupad didn't want us to equate manav seva with madhav seva that is the whole issue you know somehow it's uh, we is philanthropic activity as i mentioned in 12.11 bhagavad gita krishna says that if you can't be devoted to me do some good work sacrifice the fruits of your work so it's a noble activity maharaj ranti dev is being compassionate maharaj shibhi is being compassionate and uh, there's a whole if you read bhakti siddhant vaibhav itself there bhakti vikas maharaj who is who is no liberal and even he cannot edit out the incidents from bhakti sanat thakur's life just because they are not in line with his his vision of how the tradition should be because there are so powerful incidents that he can't edit them out so he is admitted he is written that that when devotees were going to the temples and the devotees would not give charity to the beggars over there so bhakti sanat thakur would say that oh i'll give my money to hari and that way my heart stays hard he says give give charity to the beggars so philanthropic activity is not a sinful activity uh, the only thing is philanthropic activity should not replace devotional activity so have we stopped doing our aarti and puja in the temple have we stopped doing uh, abhishek for the deities in the temple in a time of great human the pandemic is a great humanitarian crisis and at that time if we can do something for people there's nothing wrong in it so we have to very carefully understand prabhupad's context for prabhupad's critique hmm. and uh, prabhupad himself now where was the the prabhupad saw in mayapur a child going through the garbage heap and looking for some food over there he says nobody should go hungry near our temples for 10 miles now did prabhupad in that context say that oh this boy first bidding we can chant hari krishna then you give him food prabhupad didn't do that he saw prabhupad's heart was compassionate but sometimes uh, we divorce prabhupad's instructions from prabhupad as a person prabhupad was a living loving person prabhupad was compassionate and his compassion was not just only for the soul and he didn't care for the body prabhupad cared for the whole person we have we have incidents of prabhupad some devotee came to disciple was offering ras puja and prabhupad ras puja is offering a flower and he was limping and prabhupad called him and asked him what happened and then prabhupad told him you can apply this particular poultice make it like this and apply it so prabhupad says you are not the body or the soul don't bother prabhupad didn't do like that so with respect to this boy who was poor this was like our, our poverty stricken boy Prabhupad made no spiritual conditions. Make him chant only, then give him food. No, nobody around ten miles around our temple should go hungry. So now there is a concern that we as devotees shouldn't just get into humanitarian work and stop doing devotional activities. That is a concern. But Prabhupad's compassionate mood is very much embodied in different ways, and in times of times of emergency. if we can we can reach out to people and uh, assist 
at that level that's a part of compassion so i don't see any way why it is out of line with prabhupada's teachings i think if we think it is out of line with prabhupada's teaching then maybe we have a very narrow vision of what prabhupada's teachings are Hmm. So here as quote is being shared by Toshini Maipro very good thank you Okay now this is a big question and i i won't say that i have a definitive answer to this so in india nationalism is rising hindus are becoming more nationalistic due to riots and vandalization of temples in bandra people want to preserve sanatan dharma and we can it can be very fruitful if we cooperate with rss and bjp mm, will that label us uh, like hardline hindus uh, should if we join organizations like vhp rss <sighs> you know there is uh, how much a spiritual organization should get involved in the uh, local and the political scene is a open question and uh, if you look at american history there are some very important lessons which you can learn many of the evangelical churches there they aligned very strongly with the republicans and initially okay it was for some contextual purpose it was fine but then eventually what happened that there are some republican presidents who were who were quite incompetent they got into unnecessary wars and so once a political once a religious group like openly endorsed a particular political candidate then all the mistakes that that political candidate did that religious group got blamed for it and if that person did something questionable then the religious group lost its moral credibility because of that so how much to get involved it's not easy to decide now there is a scon as an institution and there are devotees as individuals who form a movement anyway this is an important concept i'll quickly this was a part of my powerpoint which i didn't speak today i'll show this to you quickly when i was talking about the expanded definitions of success so when we talk about what is a living tradition a living tradition is not just uh, uh, the number of people who come to a temple it's a network it's a culture it's a complex web of communities and institutions a network means it's people known to connected with and appreciative of the tradition even if they are not its members so that's networking you know we may have not many people may be devotees but they may be very appreciative like life members were not devotees but they supported prabhupada and a culture is a set of values beliefs and behaviors that is considered good and respectable even by those who don't follow it so in much of india people may not be devotees but people appreciate devotion to some extent then beyond that there are communities and institutions so communities are more informal institutions are more formal so as institution now communities and institutions can have a complex relationship say there can be overlapping like venn diagrams sometimes the institution may be big within that there may be a community sometimes the institution may be within a community sometimes around a community many institutions might come up sometimes around an institution many communities might come up now this this is all complicated some of you might find complicated but the point i'm making is that around an institution there can be a community which can reach out much bigger uh, than the institution so the institution cannot affiliate with any political group but the communities can that if there are devotees who are interested in politics and if a devotee at an individual level wants to campaign for a particular cause there is no one going to stop them from that they can take some guidance from the spiritual uh, their spiritual guides and they can take it forward from there so the institutions boundaries may be relatively constrained but beyond the institution is the broad movement so the movement includes the communities the movement is much bigger than the communities 
that the movement is much bigger than the institution so it could be like a sister concern so so technically speaking food for life is not its con it's a sister concern so bhakti and hospital is not technically is con it's a sister concern so devotees could start some organizations or like some initiatives if some devotees feels very strongly about a particular cause then they can work on that cause just like devotees who feel strongly about environmental environment they can work on environment and krishna consciousness devotees who work st- feel strongly about say social justice you know they can work on social justice and krishna consciousness they can br- they can take their krishna conscious wisdom and use it in social justice prabhupad says all f- isms can be spiritualized so nationalism can be spiritualized communism can be spiritualized capitalism can be spiritualized so yes the, so there are if devotees are inspired then they can form communities they can be part of the movement and they can align with uh, certain uh, certain groups and they can work accordingly so as a institution we will we are unlikely to align with any specifically political cause now as far as protecting sanatan dharma is concerned yes there are various degrees of protection sanatan dharma as uh, prabhupad just didn't give us sanatan dharma we could say prabhupad gave us the 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 summit the zenith of sanatan dharma that is pure devotional service to krishna so now for for teaching pure devotional service do we need a uh, do we need a conducive culture around us and do we need to protect that yes we need to and in some ways he in govardhan eco village maharaj has talked about the ganga jamuna saraswati project so jamuna is for taking care of for providing for helping people to grow devotionally uh saraswati is for providing people education and ganga is for providing people nutrition basic needs so the idea is that that and together there can be a triveni so there are devotees who focus on the jamuna side there are some devotees who may focus more on the ganga side some devotees may focus on the uh on the saraswati side so if devotees are individually inspired to do some things then nobody is going to s- stop them from doing that it's they they can take guidance and they can definitely do that so pranavanand prabhu till what time should we go there are a couple of questions here i don't want to go too much over time let me know prabhu maybe we can take uh, we can make two more questions we can take prabhu ji okay thank you so uh how can we so would you like to clarify about pushpa abhishek mm. well i'm not sure what is there to clarify about pushpa abhishek but uh, two three things i can say that uh, there is a devotional culture that has been a very much part of the tradition and f- that devotional culture bhakti culture has had many things and uh, using and flowers krishna se patram pushpam phalam toem so we use flowers and do abhishek of the lord so is there anything uh, objectionable in that if we use the flowers afterward we take the lord's prasad and uh, share it with each other we uh, are we gratifying our senses by that well we could say after we offer bhoga to the lord and we take the prasad are we not gratifying our senses by that does everybody who takes prasad uh taking it to going to take it in pure consciousness uh well everybody we want everybody to but no everybody doesn't necessarily so is it that krishna consciousness should not have any fun at all okay is it that is it that krishna is such a selfish enjoyer that he wants only him to enjoy and for all of us to suffer this is antithetical to the idea of god krishna doesn't want us to enjoy in a way that is harmful for ourselves 
but krishna wants us to be happy in a way that we can also be eternally happy so now when there are kirtans is it that we should not enjoy the music at all should we always have if we have sweet tunes then we will enjoy music so should we have very somber tunes sung by very poor singers so that we focus only on the holy name and we get only spiritual satisfaction and no musical satisfaction at all well, such a conception is the destruction of culture so because we may enjoy food uh, which is uh, so all the tasty food we should cook for krishna and then for us let us cook food separately which is completely tasteless and eat only that food well that doesn't make any sense at all so yes we shower flowers on each other but even if we do that that is done in a devotional way so when we eat the food now there are different offerings which come from krishna which are reciprocated in different ways so when if we say prasad is non different from krishna then what are we doing with prasad we are taking it in our mouth and we are biting it and cutting it and crushing it and then after that after that same prasad goes into our body that prasad which is non different from krishna because it comes in our body it comes out as foul smelling foul smelling substance from our body we are doing that to prasad so in order to not do something like that to prasad should we stop eating oh krishna manifests in different ways and we reciprocate with him in appropriate way so if the flowers are off, so if the food is offered to krishna the way we reciprocate with that food is by by chewing it by eating it and that is not dishonoring krishna that is the way we honor krishna so the flowers that are offered to krishna if devotees shower them on each other that's not in any way dishonor the flowers are a natural beautiful way of uh, their the nature's bounty and the prayers of queen kunti it is said that nature's bounty is the smile of krishna i'm paraphrasing prabhupad so what nature mother nature mother earth is giving we are offering to krishna in a way that is that is captivating there are many different ways in which offerings can be made to krishna so is a, a push a flower abhishek is visually very attractive it is completely natural it is aesthetically pleasing and it is a way in which the heart is charmed the heart is uplifted people are attracted so it is completely krishna centered and if there is some aesthetic attraction if there is some aesthetic pleasure associated with that that's uplifting pleasure so to uh, to to find any fault with a festival as uplifting as pushpa abhishek is is very unfortunate it's like a uh, the prabhupada would talk about um, how a fly travels around looking for stool so it's an, it's almost like that mm. so one last question now mm mm-hmm. okay now there is a second part to this question that because of the internet people may keep shopping nectar shopping and they may not commit it then it lead to too much freedom in the beginning well that's just a fact of life you know people we cannot take away people's freedom what can we do mm. i had asked this question to his gopal krishna maharaj i know it is on the internet so much is there and samara so says if, if people want internet to be their guru they don't need me then let the internet be their guru so i was amazed by that statement so you know ultimately people have to make a choice is it that they want to teach google treat keep google as their guru and uh, on google you can find uh, dirt about anyone if that's what we want to find well that's what we will find krishna at one level is yatha mam prapadyante as he says 
he is uh, he is uh, he reciprocates with our desires so if somebody wants uh, wants uh, to sh- shop for controversy krishna will give them controversy even in the name of his movement if somebody wants just to keep nectar shopping well that's what they can do as yes, we want to become spiritual seekers not just say spiritual shoppers but some people may want to shop for some time maybe for a long time uh, we can't really legislate commitment we can only inspire it so internet has definitely provided people a lot of options and what we if we present krishna consciousness in an attractive way over a period of time people get satiated they understand that oh there's, there's no substance in this and they will turn toward krishna so has the internet made things more flexible well yes but internet can also provide facility for us to stay connected now if the internet had not been there and if we had, had locked down uh, we would all have been spiritually starved it is through zoom and other things that we are staying connected so i would say there are opportunities everywhere for connecting with krishna and there are excuses everywhere for not connecting with krishna but some people will take the opportunity some people will take the excuses certainly in today's world we can say the excuses are available much more easily the excuses are much more numerous and therefore yes it is it is a challenge to take to krishna consciousness but it is a challenge for everyone in 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 could say in everything for people to be committed to anything it's not easy in today's world for people to be committed to a career committed to a job committed to a family it's not easy so that's just the nature of the age and we can't stay immune to the effect of the age now can we gain some immunity by emphasizing fidelity and not flexibility um well maybe if we really wanted to have fidelity then you know if we really wanted fidelity then those who are pure traditionalists they should stop using the internet they should stop using zoom they should all stop using all technology if you are going to only follow what prabhupad followed prabhupad never used the internet we say the internet was not there at time it is it's true but prabhupad didn't use it so why don't we in the name of fidelity stick to only do what prabhupad did and no more changes well why make the change of using the internet then now oh, this is yukta vairagya yes yukta vairagya that's true so then now what are the specific things that can be used in krishna's service that is a judgment call which uh, which our devotee guides can give us some guidance for it but ultimately each devotee has to has to take that judgment call themselves with guidance but i don't think in today's world uh, uh, legislating uh, commitment is possible and will if we say there greater fidelity for serious devotees and not flexibility in that context it may be true but as i said we need flexibility even to have fidelity if somebody says that i will not hear classes unless i am going to a temple zoom is not work, work for me well then they would not have heard any classes so it's we had to have flexibility that's how we can so it is only because of flexibility that we could maintain fidelity so the fidelity means say we should hear bhagavatam we should associate with devotees that is the principle we should be faithful to but if somebody is not ready to be flexible you know i don't believe in virtual association okay then what are you going to do physical association not possible then either have virtual association no association or certainly virtual association may not be equivalent to physical association but virtual association is definitely better than no association at all so sometimes if we don't have flexibility